Hey everyone, I'm Taylor Sparks and this is another video in our Materials Informatics series. Today we're talking about ensemble techniques. Ensemble techniques is just another tool that you can use to try and find and exploit patterns in your data, right? So they differ from linear models, which we've already talked about in some pretty key ways. And the main thing in which they differ is that instead of relying on one model to try and learn the pattern in the data, we are going to rely on a bunch of things, hence the ensemble, and a bunch of things together can make something that overall is quite strong. So if you've played StarCraft, then you know this principle, that we can actually draw an analogy to Zergling Rush, one of the most frustrating things to play against in the game. If you played StarCraft, these little Zerglings are like the worst characters in the game. They are the weakest, right? And yet, they're so cheap and easy to implement that you can just overwhelm your enemy by making a whole bunch of them early on in the game before they have a good army to stand up to you. That's the idea behind the Zergling Rush. Well. Ensemble techniques kind of do the same thing. They say, you know what, what if we just build a whole bunch of crappy, admittedly crappy models, but then we combine them together in a powerful way that we can now make good predictions. That's the idea behind ensembling. So, uh, you know, the, the decision trees that you've maybe seen before as sort of a joke actually turn out to be kind of good, weak learners. In engineering, sometimes we ask the question, you know, does something move? Well, if it doesn't, you then ask, should it move? If it doesn't, then great, no problem. But if it's supposed to move, you hit it with WD-40 and vice versa. If it uh, does move and it's not supposed to move, you hit it with duct tape, right? So these simple sort of decision trees, uh, you know, are kind of a joke, but they're actually used in materials pretty regularly. You can use decision trees like these as weak learners. Like, should something be in a certain category? Instead of asking, you know, does it move and should it? You could ask, is the electronegativity greater than or less than a certain value? Is the average weight greater than or less than value? Does it feature octahedral units or tetrahedral units, right? You could ask different questions and then you could categorize different materials into different categories, right? You could classify them or you could predict properties in the same way via regression, okay? So the idea here is that if you have an individual tree, it's not gonna do a great job, but if you have a forest, well, a forest is made up of many trees. And each tree in a forest, if you've walked through one, you know that every tree is actually a little bit different. They're not the same. They're a little bit different. And we take advantage of that here. We're going to build many, many bad models, weak learners, but we're going to build them all slightly different from one another. And we're going to let them see slightly different data sets. And in doing so, when we bring them all together, we can actually have a good tool for predicting properties, which is kind of cool. So for example, you build a bunch of n number of trees. It could be 100 or 1,000 or whatever you want, right? You build these trees, and then you send your data through, and you ask, well, what does tree number one think the outcome is? You know, what is the yield strength, or what is the category and if of the classification, or whatever, right? Well, what does tree number two, what does tree number all the way up to tree number n think? And then you just average things together if it's a regression, or you do majority voting if it's a classification, and voila, by taking the wisdom of 100 trees, which are all slightly different, you end up with a way to predict properties using many weak learners. That's the concept anyways. Now, what are the strengths of this? Random forest algorithms can be really good learners. They're just pretty good. It's a pretty good algorithm. They can learn nonlinear behavior in great ways because of the, we'll get into the details of how the tree structure actually looks, but they do a pretty good job at learning things, even nonlinear stuff. Um, because you feed them different features, so at each one of these points where you're asking a question about your materials and more on that later, you ask each tree, you send it different features. So they get different perspectives on the problem, right? And then another thing is that in some versions of your random forest, you can build all of your trees at once, making this fast. You can parallelize the construction of these trees and training of them. Um, in other versions of the random forest algorithm, it's not able to do that. You have to build them sequentially. So more on that later. It does depend on the algorithm. So ensembling method in general, it takes advantage of this sort of random forest approach. It says, okay, let's take a bunch of our weak learners, combine them together to make a strong learner. There's different variations. You can take weak learners, sometimes called base, learn base models, by the way. These are typically going to be simple. They're going to be our building blocks. And alone, they wouldn't do well because they have high bias, low complexity, or they have high variance, meaning high complexity, right? Usually, uh, they're not very complex typically. Now, to make a strong learner out of these, you're going to combine together these different weak learners to get an overall improvement in performance. But the big question is, and that's what this blog sort of addresses, is, okay, fine, we've got a whole bunch of these things. How do we put them together? And which ones do we put together? That question's a little more tricky to answer, right? Well, first off, if you combine things together that are the same type, then we call this a homogeneous ensemble. 
If you take a bunch of decision trees, and they're all decision trees, put them together and you've got a random forest. That's a homogeneous ensemble. But it's also possible to put together different types of things. Maybe you've got a linear model, a random forest, a support vector machine, which was in our next video, right? You put those together, they're different weak learners, but you can still ensemble them, but now it would be a heterogeneous ensemble, okay? So how do you know how to put them together? The guiding principle here is coherent aggregation, which means, okay, let's say we choose base models that are low bias, high variance. Well, then you should aggregate them together with a model or a method that tends to reduce variance and vice versa. If your base models are low variance, high bias, then you ought to put them together with something that reduces bias. Okay. So how do, what options are there, right? We're going to put them together. What options do we have? Well, one thing that we can do is bagging. Another is boosting. And finally stacking. What on earth is these? These sound kind of ridiculous. Bagging is when you take homogeneous weak learners, you put them together in a way where the learning happens independently. Each learner learns independently. It doesn't care what the other ones are doing, which means that this can be parallelized. That means faster, typically, right? Um, and then the final property is output by just taking some average of all these weak learners. Boosting is really similar. You're also going to start with homogeneous weak learners, let's say a bunch of decision trees. But this time, instead of training them all at the same time, right, independently and in parallel, that's not the case here. But this time, we're going to put them together sequentially. So you build one tree, you finish building that one, and then you learn from that one before you build the next tree. And then you wait till that one's done, and then you build the next tree. So you're going to do these sequentially, right? Sometimes we call this adaptive, right? In that it's depending on the previous one, what we do next. But still, when we're done, we're going to just take the average of all of these things, okay? Um, they may not be weighted equally, but we're going to use all of them in some sort of deterministic strategy. Now, finally, in stacking, this is quite different. Here we can use heterogeneous weak learners, so different types of weak learners. The learning is independent and in parallel, so we do them separately. But when we combine them, we don't just do it via averaging. Instead, we combine them with another machine learning model called a meta model, a model that takes the outputs of the lower models as the inputs to the meta model. That's the meta model, right? So it's using these weak model outputs as its input. So we will show you examples of these three things. First off, let's point out that bagging does tend to reduce variance, so it helps prevent overfitting, whereas boosting and stacking can reduce bias, but can also be made to reduce variance. Now, when I talk about this, I like to point out the so-called parable of the elephant, the blind men and the elephant. Maybe you've heard of this. There's five or six blind men and they're all, you know, they can't see. And so when an elephant approaches, they all have to feel it from their perspective. One feels the trunk and thinks it's like a vine or a rope. One feels the, the tusk and thinks it's like, I don't know, like a sword. Somebody feels the leg and thinks it's a tree. This guy feels the, the body and thinks it's a wall. And none of them is wrong. But none of them is completely right either, right? They all have a perspective, a small perspective from the overall picture. And if you were to combine all of their perspectives, then they could realize what's really going on. They could best, you know, fit the data, essentially. That's the idea behind ensembling, is that let's take all the perspectives from a bunch of weak learners and see if we can do better by combining them all together. So the first way to combine them, we said, was bagging. Bagging is short for bootstrap aggregating. Well, what is that? Bootstrap aggregating is a way to make many small data sets out of one original data set. So when you go to the literature or wherever you found your materials data, materials project, Aflow, OQMD, wherever you got it from, you've now got this data. You want to actually now give that data to a bunch of weak learners. Instead of giving every single weak learner all of your original data, we want to allow each weak learner to learn from a slight variation of the data. We want them to have their own perspective. So we're going to build the trees differently, but we're also going to give them slightly different data. Now, the way that we do that is with bootstrap aggregating. We create um, n number of bootstraps of each of size b. And we do that by just randomly drawing numbers until we have b number of you know numbers here. And we do drawing them with replacement. So for example, if this is our original data set, numbers 1 through 12, if we do sampling with replacement up to a, a value of b equals 5, so we're going to put 5 samples in our bootstrap just as an example here, it's possible that you could draw the same number twice, right? Look, here they drew 3 two times. Here they drew 5 two times, right? Because we're doing sampling with replacement, right? Bootstrapping allows us to create however many samples we want, how many uh, sample sets as we want, right? So if you want to build 1,000 different uh, decision trees to build your forest, 
great. You can build 1,000 different bootstrap samples from your original data set. So you might be wondering, like, why are we doing this? It has this problem that each data set, when you measure it, it's actually coming from what we would call a true but unknown distribution. Meaning, you know, if you have 100 data points, if you gathered another 1,000, your distribution of data or what you understand or the complexities of your data would increase. You would understand it better. And if you gathered another 1 million data points, you'd understand it even better, right? No matter what, how much data we gather, we're never going to completely know the true unknown distribution. We can't know it. All we can find is an approximation for it. Well, what bootstrapping allows us to do is to look at different glances of what that underlying distribution might be. Consider these uh, 25 examples. All 25 of these examples, these are histograms drawn from a normal distribution. You know what a normal distribution looks like. It's that sort of Gaussian curve. Now, none of these is perfect, but if you sort of averaged all 25 of those, you see that they're all sort of describing the same event, but they're taking it from a different perspective because we've done this statistically random sampling from the true unknown distribution. Bootstrapping allows us to do that. It allows us to build as many independent model data sets as we want and still maintain that their statistics are still viable. What do we mean by a viable statistics? Well, it has to do with what we call, well, anytime you're working with probability theory or statistics, uh, a collection of random variables is said to be independent and identically distributed if each random variable has the same probability distribution as all others and all of these are mutually independent. What does that mean? Sometimes people call this the IID assumption. It's basically like the underlying assumption. But if you're ever going to use a machine learning model, you have to make sure that you're adhering to the IID assumption. I love this example that came from Jason Hattrick Simpers and Brian DeCoste. Um, they basically said, well, here's an example of something that's IID. Um, two people are both flipping the exact same coin. So the if they both kept track of heads and tails, their distributions would be IID. They're independent of one another but they're identically distributed, right? There'd be no difference between them. Now consider this scenario. We are both flipping the same coin, but we scratch it every 1,000 flips. So over time, as you're flipping this coin, you're changing the way that it flips because you're scratching one side. And so it's not gonna flip the same. So this would be not independent because it's changing over time, but it's still identically distributed because the two people are doing it the same way. How about this one? We are flipping coins, but they're balanced differently. One person has a slightly balanced coin that tends to land on the head a little bit more from the other. Well, it is independent in that the data is gonna be the same over time, it's not gonna change, but the two people are not going to get, it's not identically distributed, right? And then lastly, if you do both these things together, if you're working with differently weighted coins and you scratch them every you know X number of flips, you're not independent and you're not identically distributed. So that's not a good data set to learn from. In materials world, what would this look like? I like this example, again, from them. They said, okay, IID might be you have an oxide database and you're using this oxide database to predict oxide properties or oxide phases. Great. Well, how about this one? We use a time varying oxide database. So something that over time changed in some meaningful way that is no longer independent, but it's identically distributed. How about this one? We use an oxide database, but we're trying to predict nitride phases. That's I, but not ID. And then combining those, you can get not I, not ID. Um, so bootstrapping is a pretty great way to end up with something that is close to IID. Bootstrapping allows us to create a bunch of smaller data sets, perfect for our many different ensemble, you know, weak learners that we're going to give them to, um, that more or less allows it to maintain this IID assumption, meaning we can it has good statistics, right? So what are the rules for making sure that we adhere to good statistics, that we try and stay as close as possible to IID? Well, there's two rules. First off, we need to make sure that the size of our initial data set is big enough that we're capturing most of the complexity of the underlying distribution. Um, or in other words, like if you know that it takes like a million samples to really kind of describe the, the interesting complexities happening, and then you only gather a thousand, and then you just bootstrap the hell out of that. That's not going to do you any good, right? That you're never, you can't just like create that data. You have to have that in your initial data set. 
Okay, that's representativity. Now, the second thing is that the size of your data set N should be quite a bit larger than any of your bootstrap sizes. Okay, the bootstrap should be smaller so that they're not too correlated with one another, and that allows us to have independence. Okay, so the great thing is that in the end, we can make as much data as we want, right? Because make, well, rather, we can make as many bootstraps as we want to feed to as many weak learners as we want from one single distribution, and we can do so in a way that's approximately independent and identically distributed okay so mathematically speaking this is nothing more than saying okay of your initial data set we're going to make each bootstrap is of size b right we're going to put b number of samples in there and then we're going to draw those randomly from our initial distribution until we have l number of bootstraps right so if you if you have l number of weak learners then we need l number of bootstraps each containing b number of samples okay so you're going to fit each bootstrap sample to get your weak learners. So now you've got L number of weak learners. That could be L number of decision trees. You ensemble them together with something like a, an average or a majority vote, average for aggression, majority vote for classification. And now you've got a way to actually build an ensemble that has lower variance. Pretty cool, okay? Now, a note here on how we bring together classification. There's two categories. I said that it could be via uh, voting, majority vote, but majority vote can happen two ways. There's hard voting, and there's soft voting. In hard voting, let's say we had five trees and you look at what each of the five trees says. One of them says, oh, I think that the answer is class number one and I'm 90% confident. The other ones think that it's class two and they're all you know, more than 50% confident that it's class two. In hard voting, you would say, oh, four algorithms thought that it was class two, only one thought that it was class one, so the answer is class two. And it's 80% confident, right? Because it's four to one, so that's 80%. Now compare that with soft voting. In soft voting, we don't just say winner takes all. Instead, you look at all of the probabilities for all of these things. Like take this one, class number four, true. It did think that it was, or sorry, classifier, classifier number four did think that it was class two, but it was only 65% confident. It had a 25% vote towards class one. So we include all the averages of the statistics and look how we do. In this case, it still thinks the final answer is class two, but our confidence has changed. It's no longer 80% confident. It's about two thirds, right? 66% confident. So that's hard versus soft voting. You can employ either of those methods when it comes time to averaging these things out, okay? Now, let's dive into some of the hyperparameters that are available for building a tree. We've sort of haven't said much about how exactly these things work, so let's get into it a little bit. First off, we call it a decision tree, but it's really a tree turned upside down. The root, right, is at the top, and then you see branching as it goes downward until you get to the bottom, and we call these leaves. So you have leaves, which are the bottom, the end of the tree, and you have nodes, which are sort of the splitting points of your branches where you need to make a decision. What you do is you feed this decision tree all of your data, and at the root, you ask it a question like, is the average weight greater than or less than this? Or does it contain oxygen? Or does it contain, you know, uh, cubic symmetry or whatever you want to do? Any of your features, you take a feature at random, right? And you ask it to try and split the data, right? And there's different ways to split it. We'll show it uh, some two different ways in a moment. And you do it again at this next one. And you're trying to separate out the data so that you can now classify it or make a prediction. You can build your tree as deep as you want. You can have as many branches as you want. You're gonna end up with lots and lots and lots of leaves at the bottom if you do that. And there's sort of a trade-off to be had, just like in all machine learning models, the trade-off is variance versus bias, right? If you go to a really deep tree, you're gonna get the possibility of overfitting your data because it's gonna have high variance, but low bias. And if you have a really shallow tree, in fact, if you have just a root that splits twice, we call that a stump, um, that is gonna be a very low variance, high bias approach, right? So those are better for sequential methods, whereas these ones that are higher variance are better for parallel methods, okay? But that's one parameter, is just how deep is your tree? What else can we do? Well, we need to figure out what features we use at our nodes and how many do we use, right? So the decisions are made at the nodes, at the root and at the nodes, right? But we're not gonna use all of our features. In fact, that was the whole point, to get trees that are different we don't let them use all the same features. We randomly let them sort of get it, okay? You want each tree to get some random subset of features. And a good rule of thumb is that if you have n number of total features, you don't wanna use more than square root of n number of features per tree, okay? One thing that's cool about this that is not present in other models is that this actually makes our model robust to missing data. 
because the regression or the classification can be done, but only on those trees that have the required features. Let me give you an example. Let's say you're predicting, you know, battery capacitance. And so there's the typical things like what's the anode meta, what's the cathode, what's the electrolyte, all that stuff. But maybe some papers report the particle size. And you think, dang, that particle size is kind of important, but not all of our data has it present. So do you just throw it out since it's not present? Do you try and do some sort of data curation where you fill it with an average value? You don't like any of those options because it just seems problematic. So what you can do here is you can do a random forest where you only allow predictions on some of the data where it's present. And where it's not present, you don't try and predict it uh, because you'll just send it through trees. If your tree has particle size, for example, in the node, then you'll send it data that has particle size. But if it doesn't have particle size in a node anywhere in the tree, then you can send it some of the data where particle size wasn't present. So this makes your data, your, your model more robust to missing data. Pretty cool. Okay. Now, how do we go about splitting the data, right? I, I've said that like data comes in and you pick a value of say weight or electronegativity or whatever else. How do you pick that value? The way that you pick that value is one of two ways. Well, there's several ways. We'll, we'll talk about two today. You can do it either based off of minimizing the residual. What do I mean by this? Well, the sum squared residual would be equal to the sum, let's say, on the left-hand split versus the right-hand split. So the data comes in at the root, you split it. You're going to split it such that the average value over here, if you take the, each individual prediction or each individual split and subtract from that the average value on that side and then square it, so the sum squared residual, you try and minimize that value for both the left and the right hand sides. So you try and get it so that they are close to averages. So, right, that, that's one approach. That's one way. The other way is based off of what we call entropy, nodal entropy or impurity. Sometimes you'll hear it called impurity or entropy. The idea is that, and this is called the Gini method, right? The Gini method takes into account, it says, okay, when you split something to the left or to the right, let's just look at what proportion of our data ends up on the left and the right. And you try and maximize the entropy by getting roughly equal amounts to go to left and go to the right, okay? Which mathematically is just like the proportion on the left times one over that, and then you add that to the same thing what's going on on the right. So you're trying to maximize, the, you, if you could get it to split 50-50, that would be great. That would be the right value to use, something that makes it split 50-50. That's using this entropy or Gini method, okay? Those are the two ways that we're going to pick values. Um, but, you know, we've shown you so far that like the depth of the tree, the features you use, the way that you split them, that's just three. There's tons of other hyperparameters, right? Here's sklearn. If you just pull up the random forest regressor, if you import that from sklearn.ensemble, you'll see that here's all the parameters that you could pick. Like there's tons. There's how you bootstrap, the criterion, the maximum depth, maximum features, maximum leaf nodes, the impurity. I mean, on and on and on. How many trees do you want to build? 10 versus 100 versus 1,000, right? There's lots and lots of hyperparameters. So just like we saw in our other models, we have to do hyperparameter optimization. You don't, like if you just use the default values for a tree, it's actually not terrible. But if you want to make the algorithm the best possible, then you have to do hyperparameter tuning, meaning you have to try lots of these different things with a cross-validation set, okay? Something that's really cool in Python is that you can actually visualize the trees that you build through some through libraries like GraphViz and PyDot. You can actually show an individual tree in your forest and take a look at it. Like take a look at this one. Here we are predicting who knows what, but the first thing it asks is band gap. And it asks, is the value greater than or equal to 4.1, right? There was 8,090 values that came here, right? You can see the squared error when it splits off of that. And it sends some over here and it sends some over there. And then it makes another decision. Over here, it uses volume to split, right? Is it greater than or, or is it less than or equal to some other value? And here it uses formation energy. So it doesn't have to use the same feature at the same height of the tree, if you will. Each node can have different features, right? And you can see how many samples make it through each one. And, you know, this one doesn't look like it was split very evenly. So it was probably going off of uh, some squared residual as opposed to genie, right? That was probably the splitting criteria, but I don't remember because I built this a while ago. Um, but you can see how these things actually predict. And what's cool is that, you know, the final value, if for whatever it is thing that we're predicting, I think this is density here, you can see what the average value is. Things that are greater than this band gap and greater than this formation energy have an average density of that. Whereas these ones that have greater than band gap, but less than this formation energy have a density of that and then this. So you can use these values when you're making your predictions, right? When you run your samples now, you, let's say you have a new sample and you don't know what its actual properties are. You run it through all of your trees 
and you just average the values. This one thought it was 5.2, but another tree thought it was 5.1. Another one thought it was three. So you just average all these values together and that's how you do your regression value. Um, and we already showed you how you do it for classification for voting, okay? So something that, a, a good reason to use random forest, apart from the fact that they're pretty robust, they're pretty good learners, they're, you can parallelize them for the most part, so they're fast, they're, they're just great. One of the really best parts is that you can get feature importance from them. In other words, if you have a data set that has a bunch of features and you know that probably only three or four of those features are really important and the rest are like, eh, you can actually see those with this, right? You can say, you know, maybe your feature RM and LSTAT are clearly the most important ones and the other ones are not nearly as important. You can actually quantify this with a random forest and you can't do that with every algorithm, right? That's not possible with every type of algorithm. So it's really great that random forest allows us to do it. Now, how do they do it? The way that they do it is one of two different ways, okay? You can either do it based off of what's called Gini importance or the mean decrease in impurity. Remember, Gini was our measure of entropy or impurity, like how well can you split things, right? So this one, let's read it here. It says it's defined as the total decrease in node impurity weighted by the probability of reaching that node, which is approximated by the proportion of samples reaching that node, averaged over all trees of the sample. So when you change a feature, how does it change the impurity of that node? How well does it split it? That's one way to calculate the feature weight, right? And I'm gonna skip the math here because we're not gonna do it in this class. Um, Another way to do it, which I think is really cool, is permutation importance or mean decrease in accuracy. Oh, I think this one's so cool. They use what's called an out-of-bag sample, which is sort of like a test set. Like when you're building your random forest, you pull some out as your out-of-bag sample, and you build your tree, right? You get it all trained. And then when you want to figure out how important the features are, you use the samples in this out-of-bag sample to uh, run them through the tree. You run them through the tree once and you measure the accuracy. Like what is the accuracy of the tree versus the labeled value in that sample, right? You can figure out a loss function like a, an R squared. You could do a mean absolute error, whatever you want. You can figure out some sort of measure of accuracy. But then, and this is what's clever, they take those samples in the out of bag sample set and they pick one column of your features, like the JF variable, and they replace it with random numbers, right? They randomly permute those values. So they intentionally like destroy some of the information because they destroy a column of your feature there. They run it through and they see how much worse your algorithm does. They see the reduction in accuracy. How cool is that? In the old days, they would do these studies where they would like study rabbits' brains and to figure out, you know, what part of the brain was responsible for walking, they would like cut a piece out and if the rabbit stopped walking, they'd be like, oh, that part's good for walking, I guess. They're called ablation studies. This is kind of like an ablation study. They're, they're intentionally destroying your model to figure out what made what was important to the model. Pretty clever. And here's just a cool comparison. This actually compares Gini versus randomization, which is the latter, which I just showed you. And you can see that if you look at these, here's a bunch of different features for some sort of model. They're not the exact same, right? They're different a little bit. The ones that are important are all pretty much there, but it's a slightly different order. So I think this is a cool takeaway that, you know, when somebody reports feature weight, my next question would be like, which approach did they use? And how different would it look if you did a different approach? In other words, how confident are you in this feature weight that you're reporting? Because it might be different if you used a different approach. Kind of cool. I think that's kind of cool, okay? Um, Scikit-learn calculates feature weight using Gini importance as far as I know, right? So here's the math sort of briefly behind it. It says, you know, for each decision tree, we're gonna calculate all the node importance values. So node importance for, uh, everyone is going to be ni sub j. So j is a node in your tree, right? So ni sub j, the importance of that specific node is equal to w sub j, c sub j plus w left j, c left j plus w right j, c right j. So uh, w j and c j, these c j is the impurity of your node j, w j is the weighting of that node, right? So you can get those based off of what fraction of your data reaches that node and then the splitting, what fraction goes to the left, right? And what's the impurity of the left. It's all this math that is basically having to do with the, this entropy argument that we showed you before. And then obviously you have to remember that the importance of a feature on a specific tree then has to be averaged across all of the nodes, right? Because a tree has many different splits. So you have to average it across all of those. We then have to normalize it by dividing by the sum of all of our features, right? Because there's not one feature in our data set. There's X number of them. And then you average that feature weight across all of your trees. So that's at least the idea behind how they're able to get feature weighting from Gini importance. Okay, if you didn't get that, don't worry about it. 
it's a thing that's easy to implement. Just want to give you a rough idea of what it's telling you. Okay, so I think we've done maybe a fair job of talking about bagging. Bagging, remember, we're going to bootstrap a bunch of mini samples together. We're going to train things in parallel, and we're going to use them to make predictions. Now let's contrast that to boosting. You remember that boosting was when we do things iteratively, sequentially, in an adaptive way, where each subsequent model that we build, even our weak models, we build them based off of what we learned from our previous one. So these should do better, right? If you're building them one at a time, you're, what you're losing is parallelization. Let's hope that we gain something which is better model accuracy. And that's generally true, I think, that these tend to be better models. They also tend to be slightly more prone to overfitting, though. Okay, they tend to be higher variance, lower bias. Okay, so what do we know about it? Each model creation is made where the model I is based off of previous models. You can't build your next model until you understand what the previous model did or didn't do well. And in boosting, we pay more attention to the observations that are badly handled in your previous iteration. So the, the previous time you did it, you pay attention to what didn't go well and we're going to pay attention to it in, an, in, in a more uh, focused way on our next tree to try and get it right. So in other words, this is focusing on the hardest observations to fit. Um, and we typically do this with really shallow trees because we want to, because this is prone to, the whole model is prone to ver high variance. We want to put it, we want to use low variance weak learners, which are shallow trees. So in fact, sometimes they use stumps, right? Like Adaboost uses stumps, okay? So, then the next question is, okay, I think I get it. We're going to build these trees sequentially. Um, and we're going to do that in a way where they're shallow. And we're going to pay attention to the points that didn't work. But let's get into the details of that. Like what information is actually needed from your previous model to take into account? And how exactly are we going to combine your previous model with your current model, right? How do you do that? Well, there's a couple different algorithms for doing this. There's ADA boost, which stands for adaptive boosting and there's gradient boosting. Let's talk about adapt, add a boost or adaptive boosting first. The, the idea behind here is that you build a weak learning model, you send your data through it, and you ask yourself which data points got classified correctly and which ones got classified incorrectly. Like for example here, this is like the blue area. That means that they, they called it blue, they thought it was blue, but you see that while there's some blue points here, there's this orange point that's there that got misclassified. Similarly, over here in the orange section, there's one data point that got called orange, but it's actually blue. So then what they do is they put a greater weight on those points that were misclassified. So this one, because it got it wrong, they're showing sort of weight as like the size of the marker. They're going to say, well, shoot, that point must be really important because we got it wrong. So let's, when we build it the next time, let's build it in a way that we pay attention to that one. And there's different ways you can do that. One of the clever ways they can do it is you can just duplicate that data point more times in your data set. If you make more of that data point, you're forcing more trees to pay attention to it as you bootstrap your, your samples, right? That's kind of a clever way to do it, but there's other ways, right? Um, so you're paying attention to ones you got wrong more, and then you iteratively make your model better and better until you're paying attention to these, okay? That's the idea behind add a boost, okay? Um, mathematically, this is sort of what's going on. Your ensemble is always going to be a weighted sum of your weak learners, but the catch and again, these are usually stumps. But the catch is that the weight of, sorry, your weak learners don't have the same weight. They have different coefficients. So in our typical random forest that we talked about previously with just uh, bagging, we gave all of our trees an equal vote at the end, right? We sent the data through all of them. If we built a thousand trees, then we say, well, what's the average across all 1,000? That's not what we do here because we have this C parameter multiplied by our, our weak learner model. And you might have a model that's really great and you wanna give it a lot of attention. And you might have a model that didn't do a very good job and you wanna give it less attention. So not all trees are treated equally in add a boost. That's an important point, okay? So CL is this coefficient that tells you how much weight, how much attention should I give to a specific WL, a weak learner, okay? Now solving for that analytically for like 1000 trees would be a nightmare. <laughs> It'd be really hard. We can't do that. Um, so instead, somebody clever came up with this approach to say, well, we don't, let's not solve for them all rigorously. Instead, let's just iteratively solve for the next one. So you're going to say, okay, our overall model performance, SL, is equal to what the model was on the last round, S of L minus one, plus our current round, which is just equal to the weight of that model. Well, sorry, the weight of that model is C sub L and that weak learner. Okay. And then you just keep on doing this. Once you're done with this round, then that becomes your S L minus one as you go to the next round. Right? So that, that's kind of the clever approach here. Right? And the, the catch here is that again, you're selecting how much weight do you pay attention to something, the CL value for a given weak learner. 
such that you fit your training data the best. You keep on training it and you adjust these things so that you fit it the best. So you get your maximum improvement over your previous model, okay? And obviously to do this, you have to have some sort of uh, model error or loss function. So this allows us to optimize it, uh, the model based off of this. In plain English, it's something like this. First, it updates the observation weights in the data set, and we train a new weak learner with a special focus given to observations that were misclassified by the current ensemble model. Second, it adds a weak learner to the weighted sum according to an updated coefficient, which allows us to pay attention more or less to this new one, that expresses the performance of this weak model. The better a weak learner performs, the more it should contribute to the strong learner. That's, that, that's what that C sub L is letting us do. It's letting us pay attention more or less to it, okay? Or in other words, if you consider N observations, you fit the best possible weak model to all of these observations, but they're all weighted equally, one over N, right? They all have equal weights. Now you compute the value of the update coefficient. You update the strong learner by adding this weak learner multiplied by its coefficient. And now you repeat the observations and uh, do it over again, okay? Now there's different variations on this logit boost, L2 boost, and these I think use different slightly different uh, loss functions, but it's the same idea, okay? That is add a boost. How is that different than gradient boosting? Well, they're both in the boosting category, meaning they're each going to add trees sequentially, but gradient boosting is so clever. Here's what it does. You build a weak model that predicts a value for all of your input, right? You have all your training data, which has label data. So you send the inputs, you make predictions, you compare the predictions with the labels, and you know how off you did. But here's the catch. Instead of saying, oh, we got these ones wrong, so let's pay attention to them more on the next round, that's adaptive boosting, it does something different. It says, on everything that we predicted, how far off were we? And then you write down what that residual is for every single data point. If you know what the residual is for every single data point, then you build a model that tries to predict the residuals and you try and minimize those residuals. That's what's clever. You're basically saying, how far off were we? Like, for example, here, like here was the prediction, here's the actual one or whatever. They're trying to actually measure what this residual was. And then you try and minimize those residuals. So the next time you do it, you have it like this and you're like, oh, we're a little bit less off. And so you're tightening down your ability to predict by focusing on the residuals, which is so cool. I think that's really cool. Okay. So here's mathematically what it looks like. Again, just like before, our final model S sub L is going to be L number of weak learners. We're going to average across all of them, but they're going to be weighted differently. So just like with adaptive boosting, we're going to weight each model differently. Okay. And at each iteration, we fit a weak learner to the opposite of the gradient of the fitting error. By having gradients, it allows us to solve these things rapidly because a gradient will tell you the steepest path up a mathematical function to maximize a function. So the negative gradient will tell you the fastest way to minimize a function. So if you apply this gradient, this upside down delta signal of your previous model to the error function calculated from that previous model, then we can figure out how much attention to give that new gradient tree that we just built um, to minimize the, 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 the loss function, right? So this is a really cool way to sequentially add data such that we sequentially minimize the errors of each prediction. The residuals are getting smaller and smaller. Um, pretty cool, I think. So in essence, it says each observation has a pseudo residual describing how well the model fit it, right? And so we fit a weak learner to these pseudo residuals themselves, as opposed to just trying to predict the value over and over. We're trying to predict and minimize that error. I think that's slick. Okay, in plain English, each observation has pseudo residuals equal to the observation. And then we fit weak learners to the residuals. We compute the value of the optimal step size to define by how much we want to update the ensemble to make this new weak learner, you know, go in the right direction. We update the ensemble by adding a new weak learner to make it multiplied by a step size. Hence why they call this gradient descent, a step of gradient descent, right? And we compute new pseudo residuals at that that indicate for each observation which direction we would like to update the next ensemble model predictions. Pretty cool. So gradient boosting is technically a generalized version of add a boost, but it makes it so that it's arbitrarily, it, it's, its loss function is now arbitrarily differentiable, meaning we can use gradient descent. So it's better. It should be better. And in practice, gradient boosting is a really powerful version of an ensemble technique. Woo. All right. That was a lot. Um, that was quite a bit. So we've talked about bagging. That's when you build all the trees at the same time and you just take the average and all the trees have the same vote. We talked about boosting and that's where you build them one at a time and you give different trees different votes, right? Some are more important than others. 
Um, those are both great models. That's bagging and boosting. How about stacking? Remember, stacking allows us to combine heterogeneous weak learners. It lets us put different models together. If you've got a linear model, a uh, support vector machine, a random forest, a gradient boosted forest, you can combine all of those together, right? And you do that by making a model of the models, right? So the basic steps are you take your data and split it into two folds. So half the data, you let your weak learners learn on that half. You, you use these weak learners once they're trained to make predictions for the second half of your data. And then you fit the meta model on that second fold using the predictions of the weak learners as the inputs and the actual values as the loss function criteria. So this is kind of a clever way to do it. You build a bunch of different models, you give half of them, half the data to those weak learning models, and then you, you train the, the larger model off of the inputs, using inputs as the outputs of your weak learning model, right? Um, now, technically, if you do it exactly like I described, then you're only using half of your data, and that's not a great thing to do. So we typically do k-fold splitting in training, where you train it once with one half, and then you do this whole process again, but on the other half of your data, okay? And obviously, it's possible to do multi-level stacking, where you could stack, you know, take four models to, and then take a meta model to combine these four, and then you could take four of those, and you could combine those into another one, right? You could do lots of different stacking options are possible here. Let me give you an example of stacking from our own research. This is a paper that we published in 20, what, 2020 called Extracting Knowledge DFT from DFT, Experimental Band Gap Predictions Through Ensemble Learning. So what are we doing here? The idea behind this one is that if you look at the experimental band gap and compare that with the theoretical band gap, they're never the same. DFT can do a lot of great things, but generally it doesn't quite get band gap right. There's a systematic shift where it's getting it off a little bit. So experimental band gaps are still the gold standard but we have way fewer of them. You might have a database with only a couple thousand experimental data sets, that's what we were looking at, but you have tens of thousands of DFT calculated band gaps. So our question was, well, I wonder if we could build an ensemble. We build one model or one family of models on this experimental data. We build different models on this, and then we are able to combine them together in a way that it's better with both sets, because here you leverage lots of examples. That's a good thing from a machine learning statistic. More frequency, right, is typically going to make you do better. But here we measure better data, right? And so can we combine them to get the best of both worlds? Yeah, I think we can. Here's how we did it. So the idea was we're going to take our experimental training data and we're going to let, uh, we're going to use four different machine learning models, simple ones, linear regression, random forest, gradient boosted, support vector regression, right? So four different regressions all with their own sort of, they're all weak learners. They all do, they, they have like pros and cons, each one of them, but we're gonna let all of those try and predict our experimental data. But then remember, our experimental data is only a drop in the bucket compared to all of this larger DFT data. And DFT data, since it's on the order of tens of thousands, we can do more sophisticated models. We can do neural networks, which we will talk about in a couple of videos, right? So here's the idea. Let's take these simple classical models and use them to predict uh, based off of experimental data. Let's take DFT uh, data and use neural networks to predict them. And maybe we can actually combine these things together, right? So here's the predictions of the neural networks on the DFT data. And again, we haven't talked about neural networks yet in this series, but we will soon. But essentially you're seeing the predicted value versus the actual. You're seeing the learning curve. So this red curve shows you your loss as you keep on training your data. The point here is that they do pretty good, right? They're doing pretty good. Then here's where the ensemble, the stacking happens. We take the outputs of these experimental methods and we take the outputs of the DFT methods and we're going to combine them together in an ensemble model, which I think in this case, the ensemble technique we used was a support vector machine. Um, I think it might've been a linear combination. I think it was the SVR. In any case, it was a model that used all of these as inputs to now make our final prediction. Here's how we did. If you consider just the four experimental data sets, you can see they're each of their R squared and root mean square error. And, you know, they're pretty similar, but one is worst of all, and that's our linear regression. It certainly did the worst of all of them. So the first thing we realized is that if you're paying attention to just your experimental data, you actually do better as an ensemble, ignoring DFT data for a moment, if you just chop out your linear regression, right? If you, if you don't include it, but you do include these three, then you do better overall. That's a cool finding. But then we said, what about the DFT data? Maybe we could incorporate that it works. If you incorporate DFT data, which we know has a systematic shift, but it has lots of examples to learn from, now combining these four, we get the best ensemble of all, right? Overall, we get the best performance. How cool is that? Um, just to put it into quantitatively, if you look at just the experimental models and how they can predict, and then compare that with the experimental models plus the DFT one, 
and see how that ensemble performs, we see basically double our performance across the board. We go from 1.5% improvement to R squared to 3% improvement, 5% improvement of root mean square error to 10%. Like really, really cool that actually we're able to get the best of both worlds by doing it this way, right? And then here you just see like the two, like this is just a single model, the best of our models before the SVR compared with the total ensemble that sure enough, it has tightened up our predictions and made them a little bit better via stacking. Okay. So that's it for the theory part of random forest. I'm going to hop over and do a quick example of how random forests actually look in terms of Python code. You'll see that they're actually pretty easy to implement. So let's hop over to spider real quick. Okay. And just to show you how simple it is to implement random forest algorithms, uh, let's do a quick example here in Python. Um, by the way, if you want to follow along with these or go back and run this yourself with the same code, you can. You uh, find these on our GitHub link below. So if you in the video description, there's a link to our GitHub page. We have a folder called Worked Examples, which has all sorts of worked examples for materials informatics, including this one. So I'm going to grab pandas. I'm going to grab the MP rester. That's the materials project API. To use it, you have to have your API key. And rather than show you the API key, I'm going to pull it from a file on my computer. That's what this first cell is doing. So once I've done that, I'm going to now uh, gather data using the MP rester API, right? So first, I'm going to create a pandas data frame with a bunch of empty columns for pretty formula, band gap, density, formation energy per uh, atom, and volume, OK? I'm going to grab those values only for some things in the database. I'm only going to grab it for stable oxides. So those are things that have an energy above the whole less than or equal to 20 milli electron volts. And for elements or compounds that in their element list have oxygen at least, right? They have to at least have oxygen present. So stable oxides. Um, so we're going to do the MP query where we send it the criteria, we send it the properties we want, we're able to get these things back easy peasy. Watch our previous video on uh, data set access if that's unfamiliar to you. Um, this next step was for making some custom bootstraps. I'm not going to worry about that. That was for a sort of in-class example. Instead, let's just show you how easy this is to implement. Easy peasy. From sklearn.ensemble, we're going to import random forest regressor. We're going to grab NumPy. We're going to do train test split from sklearn.model selection so we can split the data up. Um, R squared, mean absolute error, mean squared error. Okay, so we've got everything we need technically to build a model. We've got our data. We have our ability to split the data and to train test split. We've got a, a model, a random forest regressor, and we've got metrics to see how well we do. So I'm going to split the data up. I'm going to say that in the inputs, we've got band gap, formation energy per atom, and volume. And for our output, it's just going to be density. So we're going to try and predict density just off of band gap, formation energy, volume. I don't think we're going to build a very good model, but we can give it a shot. Right, so our training and test data get split up by using this train test split function from sklearn, where you send it the inputs and the outputs and tell it how big of a test set do you want, 33%, a third of our data set, and use a random seed so we can make it reproducible. Um, and then we go ahead and say, now RF, our random forest model, is equal to random forest regressor, and then we can give it some of these hyperparameters, like max depth two. Don't give me any trees bigger than two, right, is what I'm telling it there. And everything else, since I didn't say it, it's going to go ahead and use the default values. Now, if you want to learn how to do hyperparameter optimization, again, check out our GitHub below. There's a whole folder on hyperparameter optimization, including for uh, random forest. And you can see what that would look like to, to get the best possible tree uh, uh, forest built. Here, we're not going to bother. We're just going to do rf.fit. We're going to use random forest. We're going to fit the training data. And then once we do that, we're going to make our y predicted is equal to rf.predict, where you send it the test data set. And then you compare the test data set to your predictions. And you can see how you do. And I think, you know, I, I haven't been running these, but it's not very good. We don't do very great here because uh, we don't have very good features. And then I show you here in one more cell that you can actually do significantly better if instead of just using these three things uh, of formula, band gap, and uh, sorry, instead of just using formula, band gap, formation, and volume, we didn't even use formula before. We only use these three to make our predictions. If instead of that, you take formula and you create a composition-based feature vector, well, now we can predict density actually very effectively using this random forest algorithm. And you can see the code to do it here. I think I changed the depth of our trees, but all of a sudden, it can do really well because you gave it the right features. So uh, on to our next video, which is support vector machines. See you next time.